Welcome to Ambleside Flourish, brought to you by Ambleside Schools International. This is our four-part series on bringing up joyful children with Dr. Bill St. Cyr, Executive Director of Ambleside Schools International, hosted by Ambleside Schools of Colorado. Part two, the constituents of joy. So let's explore the constituents of joy. I mean, if, if we were hoping that someone would be filled with joy, character, what has to be in place? What are the building blocks for joy? The, uh, or the constituent parts? And the first might surprise you. Because remember, joy is it's good to be me here with you. So the first constituent, without, and if this is not present, joy is impossible, is belonging. You see, if it's going to be good for me to be here with you, there has to be a you that I belong to. You, one cannot experience joy as a radically autonomous individual. It is psychologically impossible, neurologically impossible. Uh, I'm the oldest of a dozen. Uh, the way my dad puts it is he made nine, bought three, and had countless on loan. Nine biological children, three adopted children, and numerous foster children through the years. And one of the foster children was Tony. When Tony came to be with us, he was about 18 months old. And his head was flat on the back and rounded. I mean, he kind of looked like Charlie Brown. And the reason was because he was put in his crib and no one ever picked him up, turned him over, did anything. And so because, you know, the, the skull saw it, because he's laying on the back of the bed, it flattened out and rounded out. So when he came to be with us at 18 months, he wouldn't cry. He wouldn't laugh. I mean, flat affect, minimal affect. I mean, he'd fall and hurt himself and nothing. Why? Because it had never mattered. I mean, when he cried, nobody would come. He belonged to no one. Now, if that had continued, the prognosis for his psychological health would have been abysmal. But it was very interesting. When he came first, you know, mom is constantly trying to tune with him constantly trying to break through. But the key, the key was my biological brother, Josh, who was six months older. And see, Josh befriended, Josh reached out to, at six, you know, he's two and Tony's 18 months, and so Josh reaches out to him. And when Josh falls, Josh cries and Josh gets picked up. And Josh looks at mom and goes bright-faced with mom. And Tony watched, and he figured it out. So he started crying and realizing that if he could cry, he could be comforted. And he started looking into your eyes and going bright-faced when you went bright-faced with him. It is impossible for school to be a joyful place or a child if they don't feel like they belong. It's impossible for that to be a joyful place for a parent if they don't feel they belong. Or a church. It's impossible for church to be a joyful place for someone if they don't feel they belong. And what does belonging mean? It means when people see me, they go bright-faced. Because they're my people and I'm part of them. And when my people see me and they go bright-faced, I know I belong to them and this can be a joyful place. A 
That's why it's so important for moms and dads with their teenagers. That when my daughter or son show up and they're 13, if I don't go bright-faced at seeing them, they, there is no way they're going to feel like they belong. And they will find another tribe. When they belong to us, they don't go looking for other tribes. <coughs> There's really only one reason a child abandons his family tribe for another. And that's because it didn't feel like it really belonged or she really belonged. And so there was no joy there. We don't leave a people. We don't leave our people if our people find joy with us and we find joy with them. Doesn't happen. Interesting, at the end of the day, nobody's leaving the church because one of the Neo-Darwinians, atheist, convinced them that intellectually Christianity is a fraud. That's not why a 20-year-old leaves. They may tell you that because they, they're just creating, fabricating a story to explain their actions. But they're just fabricating the story. The reason they left is because they didn't feel like this was my people. There was no joy there. I mean, when mom and dad can't find joy together, and they're supposed to be following Christ, and there's no joy, if I'm 18, why would I want that? I mean, I mean no joy there. I mean, we, we, we know that. 1st constituents of joy, belonging. And, you know, belonging, we can experience it in the moment, like Tony with my mother or with Josh, my brother. Or we can experience it in our memories, like me right now, thinking of Mary Ellen's going bright-faced or of my mom standing on tiptoes. Incidentally, one of the, the greatest uh, protections of marriage is if you've got lots of joy memories together. And you take time remembering. That's one of the, like, that's why like, wedding photos actually are a really good thing. And it's a really good idea to periodically pull them out. Because, you know, we're, we're remembering our joy together. Good to be me here with you. That's why occasionally, you know, kind of pulling out photo albums with your children, remembering the vacation, because we can remember and re-experience the joy together of being together. Belonging. The, the second thing is I have to perceive myself as safe and secure. One cannot experience joy and not feel, when one feels anxious. See, anxiety is almost the opposite. Anxiety is, it's not good, it's my kind of global assessment, it's not good to be me here with you right now. You, you can't feel joy and anxiety at the same time. Not possible. And so we need to be curious about that. I mean, in the light of the love of Christ, and he holds me, why am I anxious? I mean, I, if I remember correctly, he did say something like, hey guys, uh, Within the next 24 hours, uh, they're going to come arrest me, crucify me. I'm going to die an incredibly painful death. But you, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Even in that circumstance. Why? Because I'm going to go to be with the Father and 
you know, you'll, I'm going to establish mansions for you, and it's all going to be good. But we have, some of us more, some of us less, have the habit of being anxious. And often we, you know, if we grew up in anxious homes, or we grew up around, you know, if in our tribe we did not feel safe and secure, then we grow up feeling anxious, and then it gets hard. An anxious, low joy parent teaches and produces anxious, low joy children. So that's one of our great challenges. I mean, nobody raised their hands and said, gee, I volunteer. I, you know, I'd really like to be an anxious person. I, you know, I'd kind of, anytime something goes wrong, what I'd really like to happen is my stomach to go in knots and me to feel insecure. You know, that, that's what I'm signing up. Nobody does that. But sometimes we carry that it, as a habit. I mean, some of us have the habit. Again, remember, joy is a, is a character trait. It's a habit. It, as a habit, it's got a lot of subparts like belonging and uh, like feeling safe and secure because I feel protected. You know, one of the things about this culture that really produces anxiety across the board in the church is, you know, one of the great lies, you know, if I were to choose kind of two or three of the great lies that have infected this culture, one of them would be Darwinism. But I don't mean how old the earth is. That actually, in terms of a Darwinian orientation is far less significant than this one. See, Darwin suggests that there's scarcity of resources, survival of the fittest. And how many of us, our moral imaginations, the way we engage life, are shaped on the notion of scarcity of resources, survival of the fittest. I mean, a lot of Christian schools actually market to that. There are scarce resources. Uh, acceptance to elite colleges are a scarce resource. Survival of the fittest. We will make your child one of the fittest, and he will climb over the shoulders of the kind of those of the lower order and climb to the top, and he will be one of the fittest to survive, to get one of those scarce resources. Now, if you live in a world of scarcity of resources, survival of the fittest, uh, don't see how you're anxiety free. Don't see how you actually feel safe and secure in that world. On the other hand, if you live in a world in which, like, God has prepared good works for you to work, to walk in before the foundations of the earth, that he blessed you with every blessing in the heavenly places, that he, he's numbered the hairs on your head. Like, if that's the world you live in, you might actually be able to be kind of peaceful and joyful. It might actually be possible not to be anxious. But it's hard not to see ourselves as living in the world that the world tells us it is a thousand times a day. So, constituents of joy, belonging, perceived, security, safety. And here's the third thing. You got to have a reservoir of deep satisfactions. A reservoir. That there are are lots of things I can go into my memory and really appreciate, you know, that was good stuff. And it really was good stuff. So we have to have plenty of encounters with the good, capital G, the true, capital T, the, the beautiful, capital B. You know, 
I heard this, uh, this kind of diagnosis, uh, creation deficit disorder. You ever heard of that? That we're actually made to engage God's creation and nature, and if we're not actually out in the mountains and in the woods, walking among the flower and the fauna, having a garden, if we're not kind of smelling the roses, if we're not engaging the real, the good, the meaningful, I mean, the rocks that cry out the praises of the Lord. If we're not actually engaging all that's good in God's creation, we, we can suffer from creation deficit disorder. And we can really feel significantly more empty inside. You know, it's, it's the lack of what one would call real pleasures, real satisfactions. And the world offers us all kinds of counterfeits. You might call them pseudo-delights. And uh, it's interesting because our, the marketplace, it's a, it's a whole lot easier to sell pseudo-delights and to profit by them than it is to sell real pleasures. Like, I mean, so what do I mean by kind of pseudo satisfactions? I mean, anything that's addictive, like, like uh, addiction, there is pleasure there. And if one's addicted to Alcohol or chocolate? Yeah, when, when it's there, you feel the craving. When you, when you get the thing you crave, you feel a certain satisfaction and delight. But it's a pseudo-satisfaction, and then it doesn't really satisfy. And when you, when you think back later, particularly if, if one is never enough, <laughs> you know, got to have my third, and, and then then it doesn't really satisfy. Or an, another kind of pseudo-satisfaction is fanaticism. Uh, yeah. So, uh, one can think of 13-year-old girls and we're going to see the Taylor Swift concert. Now, it's one thing if you actually are going because you happen to enjoy her music and, uh, you know, I listen to occasionally a song that, okay, you know, not too bad on the orchestration, and okay, I get the lyric, you know, a lot more, mm, not so much, but okay, but there's, there's a difference between delighting in beautiful music and wanting to go because it's been marketed to me. Beca because I'm believing the marketing. So, so the, the cr there's a, a fan base that has been energized, and because that fan base wants it, oh, it must be great. And I, I and and then we go, and it's actually not a whole lot of what one would call deep satisfactions going on, but you know, it was great to be there. Fanaticism, or uh, another kind of pseudo is. Uh, Kind of vicarious experiences, and we have a culture more and more that's selling vicarious experiences. Um, so one th one thinks of screens as being the the biggest contributor there. Uh, screens that take over our autonomic nervous system and regulate us and cause you know, our heart rate to go up and then our heart rate to go down and our, get us, uh, you know, tag our adrenal glands at timed increments because they actually have done that research. You know. They, you know, the better produced, quote better, produced shows that want to get you addicted to the show, they actually know how long it takes. You know, they, you, you can hit, they, they can hit your adrenal glands, like a car crashing through a wall, somebody getting shot, some, and, and then they know how long it'll take for your adrenaline glands to reboot before they hit them again. And they actually time it to build an adrenaline addiction so that, you, you know, 
I gotta see what's gonna happen next. Okay, so can you see how those might be pseudo satisfactions that are something very different? You know, it's a very different experience if a group of guys are playing Call of Duty or they're making a puzzle, doing a puzzle together. Well, Call of Duty plays on <coughs> adrenaline addiction. It plays on pseudo-potency, right, because I'm 14. I want to feel potent that I can take on the world, but I'm scared that I can't. And, you know, got all these kind of, am I a man, am I a non man? But, you know, in Call of Duty, I can shoot them all up. If I get to, I, you know, I just go back to the last save set. I mean, that, that's the real attraction of a lot of video games and pornography for, for teenagers, right? Teenage guys, particularly, because it's pseudo-potency. I don't know how to be a man. I don't know because men are made to be potent in the world, and I don't know how to do that. But in a video game and or pornography, I can, you know, takes all the risk and all the challenge. You know, I can feel like, hey, I saved the world. You know. So, so real satisfactions, and one of the challenges we face is that we've got all these pseudo satisfactions that kind of compete. And the thing is, they're easier, where real satisfactions take more time, they're more subtle. I mean, it's the difference between developing a palate for fine wine and taking cocaine, right? I mean, for, for someone who's, who has drunk some fine wines and, and can really drink, I mean, there's deep satisfaction in a good wine that God made and intended. It's not the abuse of it, but it, it's, it takes more effort. All, most deep satisfactions take time and energy and you have to cultivate it. Where pseudo satisfactions usually take no effort. But the more you engage in pseudo satisfactions, the more empty you are because there's no, no time and energy for real satisfactions. And pseudo satisfactions do not build joy capacity. They don't build joy. I mean, nobody finished playing Call of Duty for four hours and said, gee, how joyful I am. <laughs> right? And that's not what happens. Even though I got to go back and do more, you know. But there's no joy in it. Constituents of joy, belonging, security, deep satisfactions, and finally, fruitfulness. And, and interesting, if you go back to the Genesis story of creation, you can see all of these provided for. But we're made for fruitfulness. We're made to feel like we, we're contributing to the lives of others, that we're tending a garden, that we're, there, we're creating, making, make, making a difference, nurturing, that we're fruitful. No one sustains joy who doesn't perceive themselves as being fruitful. Even if it's just in, in prayer. Because we're made for fruitfulness. So, you know, we're not, we are not being as we were intended to be if we're not in some way being fruitful. And it can be the smallest of act of kindness, but we're making a difference in, in others' lives. We're making a difference in the creating world. We're creating something good, even if it's just growing oranges. Ambleside Schools International fosters an educational renewal based upon the pedagogical insights of British educator Charlotte Mason. Serving an international community of parents, teachers, and schools, Ambleside makes a living education accessible to all. A living education empowers students to live lives rich in relationship to God, self, others, ideas, work, and creation. For additional information regarding Ambleside Schools International and training opportunities for principals, teachers, and parents, please visit our website at amblesideschools.com.